Man, you guys are the super holy crowd here on Monday. Can we pray one more time? Dear Heavenly Father, we just open ourselves up to what you want to say, to what you want to do tonight. Lord, I pray that um, tonight would be transformative, that those who um, came in seeking, we would, we would find you. Lord, your word says that if we draw near, that it would, we, would, we would find you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen, amen, amen. amen. Um, I'm excited to, to be here. I ate Ecuadorian food this um, afternoon. It was delicious. I had carne asada. What did you have? So you're like, I ate my protein shake. It was terrible. Um, I want to speak to you uh, tonight. The title of tonight's talk or sermon is Mirror, Mirror. Say Mirror, Mirror. Mirror, Mirror. Um, if you open your Bibles with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 18, it, it reads like this. Um, verse 18. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more, say more and more, like him as we are changed into his glorious image. I like the way the New King James says it. It says, now that we behold him as though in a mirror, say mirror, we are transformed into that very same image from glory to glory. So the imagery there is as we behold him as though in a mirror. When you look into a mirror, you're seeing yourself. So as we see him and behold him, he's reflecting back to us what we're supposed to look like. O open your Bible also to Psalms 105, verse 19. Psalms 105, verse 19. This is... Uh, Speaking of Joseph, and it says this, Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. So God's principal interest in your life, in my life, is that we are conformed and formed into the image of Christ. Until it came time for God to fulfill his dreams, the, another translation says he watched over his word or he tested Joseph's character. Have you ever just, there's a reason why we call this fresh wind. Because it implies that there's a moment where we feel stagnant. Is it true, right, in our walk with God? Can I just tell you this as a preacher? There are times when I study the Bible and it's not this jubilation and these words just jumping off of the page, but sometimes it's just out of discipline. Sometimes with our walk with God, have you ever just walked through those seasons where it feels like, God, are you distant? It feels like I'm praying to a brass heaven. Do you talk back? Do I actually believe that you're a God who never speaks in contradiction to the word, but independent from the word? In other words, there is still rhema word spoken right now that I can hear in my prayer room. Do you still do that? Because I haven't heard your voice in a while. And can, is there those moments where I'm like, God, I just, I'm praying, I'm reading, I'm in community, I'm doing all of the right things, and yet it just seems as if community doesn't feel the same way. It doesn't feel the same way when I read my Bible. You remember when you first came to the Lord and you would like do the Rolodex with the Bible, and you're just like, brrr, bam, and you would just stop, and it was the perfect scripture for that moment. How many of you were there? Say yes. And now you try to do that in some obscure passage in Leviticus and you don't know how to interpret that? Like, what in the world I'm supposed... God, that doesn't make any sense, you know, and it just, it just doesn't work the same way that it used to. And it seems as if God has left us in a place abandoned it almost seems as if God has has exited the room and he's no longer with us and you're just how do I make sense God of this confusion this isolation this hurt this anger this betrayal how do I make sense of this and God is handing us a mirror and God is handing us a mirror. His principal interest in our life is that we would be formed into the likeness of his son. Why do I feel so burned out? I'm doing all of the right things. And we go through these seasons in our walk with God and, 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 and it, it doesn't seem to make sense because we're actually doing the right thing. And I'm talking to a Monday night crowd that came to church. And so here's what I can assume that the majority of you are at least doing the right thing or wanting 
to do the right thing. And yet, if I don't need a raise of hands, I'm in the room and I know it. Half of you, if not more, are going through a dry season. And, and I grew up, and you know what's crazy is this happens corporately too. If you look at just a perusal of church history, you'll see that movements go and they come and they seem to be, I've been pastoring long enough to see a movement go boom to then flatline to all, sometimes even shrink and we think, and I'm thinking, oh my God, is this what, what just happened? And then ultimately for that movement to grow again. You know, there are movements now that much of the young people, they're under the fanfare of the world for good reason. God is doing incredible things through them. But they were once influenced by previous movements that no one knows anymore. And usually the thought is, well, they must have lost the anointing. They didn't contextualize to a multi-ethnic, urban, transient culture. Therefore, they, be, they begin to not reach people anymore. And maybe they just needed to change leadership. Or maybe the church needed to try something new. It must have needed a new strategy, a new pragmatic. It must need something. Then it could be that God actually removed something. Because if he just kept blessing something, you'd be a spoiled little brat. And he wanted to deepen a movement instead of just grow them. Because not all growth is healthy. If you broke your ankle and it swelled, that's not healthy growth. But if I put you under tension and stress and muscle over time begin to grow, that's real growth. The problem is we usually call swells growth when it's not actually from resistance. And God hands us a mirror. And God hands us a mirror. And I grew up super charismatic and Pentecostal, and I'm so thankful for my tradition. I mean, we would rebuke the devil out of everything. We didn't eat deviled eggs because they're demonic. The little Hoover dirt devil vacuum, there's no way in God's green earth we're buying that thing. That's the devil, bless God, amen. I mean, we were, we, I mean, it was, you know, it was girls in skirts and, and I mean, all the stuff. When I first got my ears pierced, it was, it was the devil, bless God, amen. I mean, no one, it was, you know, how many of you grew up like that? I mean, super Pentecostal. And the other thing was, I mean, we knew how to pray. We got taught how to pray really early on. And, and, and the, the, the issue was, well, we were supposed to rebuke away every storm. We are, we are children of Pentecost. We have an open heaven. We have rivers of living water flowing through our belly. We don't know dry seasons. That's an Old Testament paradigm. We have the open heaven that never closed. We need to contend. We need to, we need to come in here. We got to get unction. And I'm reading Leonard Ravenhill at 16 years old, Why Revival Terries. And I'm burning on my high school campus at 16 years old. And I'm like, oh, with all thy getting, get unction. If you don't pray for 10 hours a day, you're not worth your salt as a preacher. How many of you ever read Leonard Ravenhill? Go bless yourself and read it. The five of us that have been here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This dude's so hardcore. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to breathe. And, and then it's like, it's like dry seasons don't exist in, in Pentecost. The problem is that doesn't jive with life. It doesn't even jive with the order of creation in the design God put on earth. There are seasons, say seasons. That doesn't jive with even the biblical record. We would have to apologize to every single one of the disciples because they all died a martyr's death. John being on the island of Patmos, I mean, darn near died a, 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 a martyr's death. We would have to apologize to them if life was just hunky-dory and perfectly along the right. We would have to apologize to them. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 says this, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Second part of the verse, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Could it be that your lack of feelings and the suffering you're going through might just not be because of your disobedience. It may not be because something's wrong with you, but because there's some, so much right on the inside of you and you're doing so much right that God trusts you now with a season where he can remove some things so that he can ultimately reveal something in you so that he can heal it deeper again. And he hands us a mirror because prosperity is a horrible teacher. Prosperity is a horrible teacher. There are gray hairs in here, and you know this better than I do. You have walked through life long enough to know the greatest seasons of growth and maturation in your life have come through suffering, the crucible of trial, the crucible of hurts and pains, and the feelings of, and you stood the test of it. When you didn't feel like church was on fire and you still kept praising, you realized something about God. He wasn't contingent on your feelings. We base our relationship with God on how close we feel to him, when that is always arbitrary, but how close he is to us never changes. Do you believe that? Say yes. And in those moments, he hands us a mirror. 
I believe 2020 provided an opportunity for God to hand the corporate sea church a mirror. And the suffering revealed a lot. You're in part of an incredible church, a disciple church, a healthy Bible-believing church, but I'm talking about the corporate sea church. We saw a lot of things that were undesirable. Do you, amen? And God handed us a mirror. Could 2020, a suffering, have been given or allowed for us to actually grow? Because he's going to work all things out for our good. And allows this thing to reveal something about us so that we can ultimately change. And he hands us a mirror. He watched over Joseph's character. He watched over Joseph's character. He tested his character. He tested his character. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says that we go through the testing of our faith. And at the end of verse 4, it says, and it makes us perfect and complete. That is not a message we like to preach in church. That suffering and testing is actually making us perfect and complete. I don't want to sign up for trials. Amen? I'm not trying to go through more hard things. I have a t-shirt on a hard life. I got it. I wore it out. I'm a card-carrying member of a hard life. I don't want to go through any more hard things. But prosperity is a horrible teacher. And God will allow these moments where he'll pull the feelings back. He'll pull back and allow suffering to ultimately hand us a mirror and say, son, daughter, I want to reveal something to you so that I can ultimately heal something in you. This is what I do. Life moves in encyclical patterns. If you look at the Psalms, you have the Messianic trilogy of Psalms from Psalms 22, 23, and 24. You see in Psalms 22, he's echoing what happens at Calvary. Father, why have you forsaken me? My enemies, they, they crowd around me like bulls. They're ripping into my skin. I can see my bones. My life poured out on me like water. It's literally the description of what's happening at Calvary. And then he comes into the tranquility of Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And then he comes into the triumph of Psalms 24. And he says, oh, look who comes. The ancient one with angel armies and open up the gates and this triumphant. Don't you see that life sometimes just moves like that? You go through this deep suffering and then you find that there's a shepherd who walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. Then you come to the establishment of God doing something in your life. Graham Cook calls this in, in Joseph's life the the, demon, the, the the declaration of a promise or a word, the distress of that word in Potiphar's house, and then the development of that word in the jailhouse, and then the demonstration of that word under Pharaoh's leadership. Did you know that life is gonna go like that? We love declaration. We don't like distress. Development hurts, and demonstration is God's grace. But does, if you notice that life moves like that, I look at young people and I tell them, listen, you gotta really look at your purity as something to guard, because here's the thing. Marrying someone is one of the most, is the second most important decision you will ever make in your life. Married people say amen. You wanna be an engineer? Marry the wrong person. You won't be, I promise you that. You wanna be in ministry? Marry the wrong person. You won't be. But here's the test. The test is trust. Can I trust God with one of the most great, with one of the greatest desires in my heart? To be loved, to be fully known, to give myself to someone. If I can't learn to trust him in my teenage years with this huge thing, I won't trust him with purpose in my 20s. Because I didn't pass the test of trust. Life is encyclical. Some of you with gray hair are taking the test of trust again with grandchildren, with children, with the, the transition of a church, or whatever that, we take it over and over. Do you, do you, do you coincide with that? Say yes. Walter Brueggemann, one of my favorite Old Testament scholars, says this, when, he, when you look at the Psalms, you will find that either we come from secure orientation to disorientation, and, and all, obviously back to reorientation. And you see the Psalms, I love the Psalms. In fact, here's a little counseling tip. If, I was in, if you were in my pastoral office and you were going through something and I didn't have an answer, I would tell you, open up the book of Psalms, open to the middle, start reading until you find a Psalm that resonates with what you're feeling. 
because every human experience is written about explicitly in the book of Psalms. So it goes from secure orientation, I can see clearly now, I mean, it's like, it's always like springtime with you, it's just this beautiful time with Jesus. And then you go through disorientation. God, do you even care? Where are you? And then to reorientation. Over and over, whether you're walking through the imprecatory psalms, which are the psalms that are super visceral and livid and want to like smash my enemies, kill them, rip their eyeballs out, I love those ones. <laughs> I love those ones. The lament psalms, super, I don't even know why I say lament, the crybaby psalms, whatever word is better descriptive there than lament. It sounds so churchy. And then, right, and then you have the other psalms. Two thirds of the psalms are imprecatory or lament psalms. This disorientation, this honesty before God poured out and God is handing them a mirror. Isn't it interesting that David had to, he had to get anointed and then be on the, the run from Saul so that God could form his character so that he can ultimately stand in kingship. Does that make sense? Say yes, he hands him a mirror. What's God doing in a cave? He's revealing David to David so that he can heal David. Because prosperity is a horrible teacher. God's principal interest in your life and in my life is who we are becoming. Not what we're doing, but who we're becoming. And he lets us come to our senses. He hands the prodigal son a mirror. And it says these exact words, and he came to his senses. He could not see himself until he had been brought out of a place of strength, out of a place of competence, out of a place of knowing. One of the greatest, easiest places for us to hide, those of us who have an idol for success, is in ministry or in the church because we can masquerade it with gospel language. Well, I just want to see the church grow, brother. No, you want to feel self-important. But until the church doesn't grow, you can't have that mirror put in front of you. Well, I just want to see the business grow. I want to give more to missions. Maybe. But when you don't get that contract and the mirror's handed to you, you're still a son. Even if you didn't give the same. And what I want to reveal is you have an insecurity there. Can I heal it now? Your suffering or your lack of feelings just might be God. It just might be God, that you go, the patristic fathers called it the dark night of the soul, the dark night of the soul that we would walk through this place. And here's our response usually to these moments. We have two primary responses. Number one, we want control. God, tell me what to do. What's the formula? I'll pray, I'll read every spiritual formation book. Do you want me to read Richard Foster? Do you want me to read Eugene Peterson? Do you want me to read Dallas Willard? Do you want me to read John Orberg? Do you want me to read uh, more contemporary John Mark Homer or Rich Velodas? For those of you, probably just the ministry guys will know those names, but the guys who are like kind of majoring on spiritual formation. Do you want me to do that? Do you want me to follow, you know, all of these little X's and O's and all of this stuff? God, what, what do you want me to do? Let me just control something. The problem with that is we're not seeking God for relationship. We're seeking him for meaning, purpose in our own better life even doing spiritual things we have to be removed from a honeymoon season every relationship that stays in a honeymoon season is deficient and not actually intimate hello those of us who have been married at least over a decade you will know if you've stood the test of time that individual will make you more frustrated than any human being on the face of the earth and you will love that human being more than anyone on the face of the earth and your relationship now has depth not just you look good girl right amen i'm not gonna look this good forever so it's got to be more than that i'm just kidding amen so we want control. It, it, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 13 through 14 says this. It, um, it says, accept the way God does things. For who can straighten what he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can. But when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in life. God never actually lets us in on our future. Isn't that frustrating? And in fact, in Matthew 6, 34, he says, listen, listen. Don't worry about tomorrow. It has its own problems. Today's are sufficient. He doesn't even let us worry about tomorrow. That is extremely frustrating for someone like me that wants a plan, that wants to map things out. And, and in James chapter, uh, um, James chapter 4, verses 14 and 16, it says, don't say you're going to go make money here and make money there next year, for you're all boasting in your own pretentious plans. 
Could it be that we're so wanting our plans, what we really want is, God, God, I'm inviting you to be a part of my life instead of humbly coming and answering the invitation to share in his. We want control. The other primary response is we want a theophany, big, fancy, $12 churchy word to say we want an encounter or an experience. God, and camps are the worst for this. Young people, hear me. We come to camp or, or a conference and we can, God met me at this altar and I had snot bubbles and tears. <laughs> and I had all the goose pimples. And listen, goose pimples are awesome. But, it, but when we have them, they're incredible. But it does not mean that God is not moving when you don't have them. And so what can end up happening is we become dependent on these encounters. And we think if we didn't cry like we did the last time or we didn't feel the goosebumps like we did the last time, God must not have moved. And what I need right now is just another encounter. I just need another moment. And God moves through encounters, right? B Moses has the burning bush experience. David does have the flask of oil actually dropped on him, right? We do have these encounters that are paramount. Jesus has an encounter with the Holy Spirit, right? Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3. He has an encounter. Paul, on the road to Damascus, has an encounter with Jesus. God, you moves through encounters, but encounters in and of themselves are never sufficient to sustain you in a walk with God. If they were, the children of Israel would be exhibit A. Ten plagues drown that army and they still build a golden calf. And they still build a golden calf. Jesus comes out of that, the Jordan River straight into the wilderness and is tempted. So evidently, his formation, and it says, this, it says this in Hebrews, that he learned obedience, Jesus, by the things he suffered. I know this is not like super exhortation message, but I'm, I'm just convinced we have to grow. I have to grow. Can I say that? Gabriel needs to grow. And I'm just willing to stand before the Lord and say, God, give me a mirror. Let me see what I can't see when things are good so that you can heal in me for good. Amen? At a deeper level, we're learning how free we actually are. How free we actually are. And so we want an encounter. And, and we start using God as a slot machine. And, and, and we think that, man, I just need to be more ardent in my pursuit of God. That's how I'm gonna get through this. And, and we create these formulas and we look at certain people as though they're more spiritual. And really, all they have is a personality trait. They might be just be more predisposed to looking disciplined or radical. God, I must, I must not, I just must not have it anymore. It must be me. And God is wanting to hand you a mirror and, and ask the question, why do I want, what are you trying to reveal right now that I can't see in a prosperous moment, in a place of strength? Because he's taking us to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. This is so mind boggling to me that God's power is made perfect. His strength is most powerful in what? Our weakness. In our weakness, that cuts against the grain of our Western humanism so bad. But the Bible is not Western. It's technically written in the East. Not from our culture. And, and, and what's being popularized right now is this, this word deconstructionism. And, and I'm okay with deconstructing. I'm just saying that you should deconstruct culture in light of the Bible, not deconstruct the Bible in light of culture. And, and we, can, we can be hard on the young people, the young adults who are deconstructing right now their faith, but here's the reality is as, even us as older people have deconstructed an American ideology and placed that on the Bible instead of the other way around. Amen? And so we don't need another power encounter all the time. Sometimes we just need a truth encounter. 
You, sometimes you gotta just be able to stand up and say, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And you don't need to feel like you cried at the altar to know you're not full of lust anymore. Sometimes you gotta be able to look up at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not full of lust, I'm free indeed, I'm pure, I'm holy, I'm righteous. You gotta be able to say, and, and you gotta allow that mirror to come up and say, because you, if you just keep allowing this encounter or that or whatever arbitrary thing that you place in front of it, you remain ill formed and not actually in the place. We don't need another power encounter. We need a truth encounter. I'm telling you, I went to every deliverance ministry. I went to every, every part of counseling that I could go to. I had mentorship with my pastor, and it wasn't until I had a truth encounter and began to believe what actually happened independent of my feelings and appropriated by the confession of my faith that I was free that I was really free. We don't need sometimes another, another a victory. We just need a real surrender. A real surrender. And he just hands mirror, mirror. And you know what's hard? What's really hard, this is hard. How many, I love the beginning of my walk with God. And, and I still go through moments where it does feel just exuberant and God is, he's in the room. I mean, you can like, you, you feel like you can cut the spirit in. It just feels thick. I want you to know that you still have those moments of romance, like any marriage. You still revisit moments where it, it's almost like the honeymoon again. So I don't want to, it's not, oh, serving God is for, it's going to be super drab. You know, like just horrible. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. But I, what I am saying is you, you walk these seasons. And here's what's hard. The spiritual disciplines, prayer, community, reading our word, sacrificial giving, you, you know, servanthood, all of these spiritual disciplines, they were so fun at first. And then somehow they don't seem fun anymore and you're like, I don't feel like I'm not getting the feeling anymore and, and here's the danger. We begin to think that those when we, that we felt it in the beginning was a result of consequence and it wasn't a result of consequence it was coincidence. Let me explain. God allows us many times in the beginning of our walk with God to feel the pleasures of community, the pleasure of reading our Bible in a way that's just so robust. It's leaping off of the pages for us. The pleasures of prayer, because many times we're exchanging pleasures that came from the world. We were full of lust. We had an addicted personality. We were with the wrong crowd. And so he allows us to replace those and it wasn't that you were more ardent or more radical or more given to these things in the beginning. It was that God was allowing feelings. And so now you think, it must be because I'm not pursuing him as much before. And we start sowing into the flesh thinking, I just need to work more. I just need to try harder. And the gospel is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to earning. You're going to have to work hard to believe that God loves you just as much when you don't feel it. And because he hands us a mirror, do you really want me a part of your life or do you want a better life for yourself? Am I just a slot machine? Mirror, mirror. Is this making sense? And God takes us through this formation and it's always encyclical. I took over a ministry in Florida it was the first time in my life a ministry didn't go boom. And I would get up on stages and I would talk to pastors and do leader sessions and I would tell them, listen, brother, brother, it's not about numbers. Because you know why? I went home to numbers. And so I thought, I'm good with that. And then I took over this movement in Florida that didn't grow quickly. It grew, but it didn't grow quickly. And I was like, and all these insecurities begin to surface. I was like, what in the world? God actually had, and I thought I was less of a leader. I thought I was less spiritual. I wasn't praying as much. That, that must be the answer. I'm not fasting like I did in the beginning of my ministry. I need, I need to suck myself back down to 125 pounds and high school wrestler. I mean, I got to do something radical. I mean, my left leg weighs 125 pounds now. I mean, it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something radical. It must be because of that. I mean, I went through all of this in my life, so insecure, and God was handing me a mirror, and he said, what I really want to heal, Gabriel, is that five-year-old boy that sat inside of a homeless shelter and looked at his mom and said these words, said, Mom, why don't I have cleats like so-and-so on my t-ball team? And my mom said, because so-and-so has their dad. I had an uncle that paid 
paid for me and my brother to play sports year round, basketball, football, and baseball, then in high school, track and wrestling. And, and, and I, he would pay all the time. So we were able to play sports the whole time, but we didn't have cleats. I literally had holes in the soles of my shoes. And I asked my mom, I said, I said, mom, why don't I have cleats like so-and-so? And she said, because so-and-so has their dad. And God handed me a mirror in 2019 and allowed me to see this five-year-old boy that was still out to prove himself because he didn't have his dad. I never would have saw that moment if I wasn't taken from a prosperous place into a place of weakness and allowed God to say, God, and he allowed him to heal it and say, you're a son. You're a son. I'm not here to impress you. I'm here to be faithful. I'm a son. I'm not here for you to like me. I'm here to be faithful because I'm a son. Does that make sense? Say yes. It's in these moments where we allow prosperity of purpose, prosperity of success. And I'm not talking prosperity just like fiscally and like you, you have, you're able, you know, affluence prosperity in a general sense. If that's not pulled away, we can't see what's in the mirror that God wants to heal. Does that make sense? Say yes. And then 2020 happened. It's the crescendo of God handing me a mirror. He's still handing me mirrors, praise God. We're still, I'm, amen. I live with me, I'm totally unimpressed. For real, I, if you're impressed with yourself, live with yourself some more. And be honest, 2020 was rough because I couldn't strategize myself out of a pandemic. We had said yes to go plant churches in Southern California. I was the co-director for a church planting organization that was planting churches, and we were contextualizing for an urban environment. It's, It's difficult to plant churches in a very expensive global market. You just, you have to employ different methodologies and in the trainings a little bit different was excited about it, was super scared. I had to raise half of my support, so half was coming from the org, half was coming from support. I was coming from a mega church salary, traveling, and, and had really seen for uh, more, was able to take care of my family for the first time. I grew up in real poverty. The first time I ever had clothes from the store to my body, I was 14 years old and a freshman in high school and my youth pastor and a contractor from the church bought me school clothes. As I went. That was the first time ever I ever had clothes. They actually took tags off, and they weren't like hand-me-downs and someone giving me clothes. I mean, I grew up as poor as America can offer. I lived in a car, then into homeless shelters. And so this was the first time I wasn't in an extreme poverty. I was sacrificed everything to go across Southern California. We stop in Dallas only because I have four speaking assignments, and it worked well because it broke up the, the trip from South Florida all the way to Southern California. All our stuff is moved in two 16-foot moving pods. All of it's already over there. Our cars, everything. We stop in, in Dallas, and I'm only there for speaking engagements. And that day we get there, shelter in place starts. Everything shuts down. Speaking engagements are done. And then you all know, California shut down more than any other state. Like, yet to still fairly fully open. So we couldn't fully realize, I'm trying to train, you know, church planners online through zoom and like you're trying to like pivot and make sure you can still do things you remember all that and it 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 ends up translating into 19 and a half weeks living out of a suitcase with my three kids and my wife we got to dallas and my little daughter was only six months old we didn't have toys because we didn't travel with them we thought we were only going to be there for four days it was all and this all our stuff was in moving pods it was seventy eight hundred dollars to move it back and i was sitting couch surfing from friend's house to friend's house and i was realizing one of the greatest fears i ever had and that was to be homeless with my family like i was homeless and you feel isolated because i'm not calling any of my ministry friends because we're all hurting too we're like man i don't know what's going on how are we going to figure all this out And God began to hand me a mirror again. He said, do you really trust me? Or are you dependent on your organizational acumen, your competence, your hard work? I'm a really hard worker. I can actually tell you that. Like most people, they can't run with me. I will, I'm multitask, keep going, keep going, energizer bunny. It didn't matter. God took me to a place of weakness. I couldn't work myself out of a pandemic. I couldn't strategize myself out of 2020. And God took me to a place of trust that I never, ever thought was possible. And it would have never happened without a place of prosperity being ripped from me. Mirror, mirror, Gabriel, new hope. I want to reveal something so that I can ultimately heal something. I know you're tired. I know you might feel burned out. 
I know you're still doing the right things. I know they betrayed you. Can we be honest? Prayer is not primarily a place to be productive, a place to be good. It's primarily a place to be honest. Stop the self-talk. You know he hears it anyways. Talking to yourself is weird anyway. You know, you know how the talk goes. And I do self-talk because I'm, I'm, I'm the worst of this. If I, if I have a problem with someone, I, I have like conversations with my head about confronting them. Do any of you do that? Then what I didn't realize is God actually wants to reveal something to me. And God isn't as petty as I am in wanting to punish them because whatever. And so I sit there and I'm like, God, you see Carl. He's frustrating me so bad. He did this. That's not cool. That's not right. And I just start talking to God. I just turn it into a conversation. And I say, now, God, what do you want to reveal to me? And more often than not, I can see where I'm actually culpable. But I would never see it if I don't just allow God to give me a mirror. Because even when we quote Romans 8.28, oh, that all things work out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose and are being transformed into the image of his son. So even the good may not be a miracle, may not even be an exit out of a season, but the good that that text is actually talking about is yours and my formation into the likeness of Christ. Amen? I'm telling you, God is just sees things from a totally different place and he hands us a mirror. I'm transforming you into my image. Amen? If I could have the band come up. God is, God, you know that mass, that appliances are mass produced. I'm always trepidatious to give a prescription on spiritual disciplines. I think that things are helpful. I think there are things that are non-negotiable. You gotta be in your word, right? You need to be connected to biblical community. You've got to do things like, I think generosity is a spiritual discipline that keeps you in a place of dependence and trust on God. There's, there's things that are non-negotiable, but I don't like to give a certain prescription on how God forms people because it's only mass, appliances are mass produced, but masterpieces are always unique and one of a kind. If you look through the record of the Bible, and it was, you know, he has Abraham take a walk, Elijah take a nap, Joshua take a lap, and Adam take the rap. He gave Moses a 40 year time out, he gave David a harp and a dance, and he gave Paul a pen and a scroll. He wrestled with Jacob, argued with Job, whispered to Elijah, warned Cain, and comforted Hagar. He gave Aaron the altar, Miriam a song, Gideon a fleece, Peter a name, and Elisha a mantle. Jesus was stern with the rich wrong ruler, tender with the woman caught in adultery, patient with the disciples, blistering with the scribes, gentle with children, and gracious with the thief on the cross. Do you see that the mirror and what it reflects back is different every time? What I don't want us to do is begin to beat ourselves up because we don't feel the same way we did in the previous. I'm less spiritual. Stop. God is bringing you to be the most exposed, to be the most revealed you've ever been, to have ultimately realize you are the most accepted and forgiven you've ever been. God loves you just as much now as he did yesterday or as he ever is going to in the future. He's handing you a mirror because he loves you. You know that I have to create sufferings for my children for them to grow. Oh, my kids right now, they, we call it, we call it uh, stat, sort, and dump. And this, so they got to clear their plates, get it into the sink, because their mom is not their maid, and I am not their butler. If I continue to just do everything for them, we spoil little spoon-fed brats. I have to create a suffering of sense for them to actually grow. Does that make sense? God is this suffering, the lack of feelings you're going through, is he's handing you a mirror because he loves you. It's not a lack of his, of his, uh, of his presence in your life, but it is the absolute truth that he is intentionally loving and fathering you. He's committed to who you're becoming. It's never easy to get a mirror and hand it to us. It's never an easy proposition for us to walk through. And, here, and here's the thing, if you're listening to this message, you're saying, okay, that's good, that's good, I gotta work on that. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be better at that. You've already missed it. You've already missed it because if your knee-jerk reaction is I gotta go work on that, I gotta, I gotta be like, you're, you're not allowing him to just reveal a mirror. You're starting to go back in the flesh. You want a formula, you want control. Does that make sense? He's trying to bring us to the place of surrender. 
We usually don't want to see what's under the surface. We're willing to see the good, but seldom want to see the bad. We were fully forgiven. This is the exact place Christ is trying to get us to, to the place of surrender and honesty, to the place of surrender and honesty. He's bringing us to John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Problem is we can do a lot of things and you don't realize what you were doing without him until he brings you to the place that you can't do nothing. I didn't realize I could do a lot of ministry without God. That is scary. And I think the Capital C Church realized in 2020, we did a lot of ministry without God. Not this church. Y'all are amazing. I'm talking about Capital C Church. I think we realize when we come to these burned out moments how much we were trying to do without God. How much we were actually trying to do without him. And we start off, the human will is powerful, but it is weak at the same time. The human will can get you on a workout plan. The human will can get you to write a New Year's resolution. The human will can get you to, to fall in love with Jesus, to say yes to him in salvation. But the human will is only enough to initiate something, but not sustain it. It's almost like the arrow, but you need the shaft of that, of that bow to actually pierce through something. And we usually find it, right? You start off with such good intentions. God, I don't wanna do that anymore. I don't wanna go into that sin anymore. And you do it again and you're so bewildered. And the fact that it bothers you tells me that wasn't your intention. The fact that it bothers you tells me it's not you. You don't have to tell a dog to chase his tail. He just does because he's a dog. Your lust and your sin or your addiction or your discouragement, it bothers you because it's not you. It's coming from an outside source and God is trying to hand you a mirror to show you how incredible you actually are. This is not you. Amen? That is not you. Matthew 11, 25 through 29. I, I love this scripture. I'm just, I'm just gonna read it. It's, it's when he begins to talk about his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he, he says this in the text. I'm sorry, I want to say it correctly. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. Oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. My Father has entrusted everything to me, not, all, not one, no one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chose to reveal Him. Then Jesus said to me, see, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden I give you is light. And I think God sometimes just pulls it back and he allows that load to get heavy and he hands you a mirror and says, look, you're carrying something you're not supposed to. You're carrying something you're not supposed to. He's not afraid of our mess. He's the master gardener. He's not afraid of the dirt. He's not afraid of your dirt. I ultimately think that's what the mirror is. Hey, look, you're carrying something that's God weight. It's too heavy for you. I'm, not, I'm sorry, Jesus, here it is back to you. Here it is back to you. Here it is given back to you. Here it is, I'm, I'm giving it back. I'm not, I don't, I don't wanna hold that anymore. I can't do that anymore. You know what I love about the story of Moses and the children of Israel is that God led them through the wilderness but sometimes I get this imagery like he, he sent them to the wilderness to purge out their sin and Egypt that was in them. Nothing could be further from the truth. He didn't send them to the wilderness. He went to the wilderness with them. He wandered with them for 40 years. A cloud by day, a fire by night, and a tabernacle. And he spoke to them and he stayed with them and he offered them manna from heaven every day. Say every day. 
He didn't send them to the wilderness to purge out Egypt. He went with them to the wilderness to purge out Egypt. When God hands you a mirror, he doesn't send you to a suffering, send you to a lack of feelings. He goes with you in the suffering. He goes with you in the lack of feelings because it's in that place. He's purging Egypt out of us. And until you can get into the wilderness and get the mirror and show this is not who you are. I know you've been a slave for 400 years, but I'm trying to teach you what freedom looks like. And until I get you out of there and hand you a mirror, you'll never know it. Can I just have every head bowed and every eye closed? Let's just take a moment. I just really still before the Lord. God, what do you want to reveal right now that I know you want to heal? Where am I discouraged? Where am I anxious? Where am I frustrated by a lack of feelings? Where have I allowed the idol of success or accomplishment? Why do I want vengeance so bad? Why do I want to be vindicated so bad? It's only through that crucible that Joseph stands at the end of all those trials and he says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's not until you walk through all of that that you can actually see that on the other end. If you feel like as I'm talking, God's been revealing something, you kind of know what that is. Would you just raise your hand? Just right where you're sitting, you kind of know what that is. God's been revealing it to you. I see hands going up. I see hands going up. I see hands going up. We're going to go into some worship right now. You can stand. You can stay sitting. I just really want this to be a time with you and the Lord. You can come to the altars. They're open. Sometimes that's easy. It gets you from the distraction of the people around you. Let's just worship and say, God, hand me the mirror and allow me to humbly and honestly look at what you're trying to reveal because your principal interest in my life is who I'm becoming. God is so faithful to the work that he started. He's faithful to complete the work that he started in us. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, he's faithful. I pray that you're set free tonight from feelings of guilt or like it's your fault for the suffering, the lack of simply be. It's the tool that God's using in this moment to form you. Because here's the reality. Rough tools make beautiful furniture. You need a saw. You need sandpaper to create a beautiful piece of furniture. It just is just that way. You are his masterpiece that he's fully committed to. Jesus, we submit ourselves to your process. We say, God, come and Form us into the likeness of your son. God, allow us to be pure image bearers to a dying and hurting world. God, we release guilt, shame, pride, anger, unforgiveness. And God, we ask you to imprint on us your image your image, we say yes to denying ourselves daily. We say yes to looking into the mirror honestly and humbly. And we invite you to do the work. We know we cannot do this in and of ourselves. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, New Hope said, amen, amen, amen. I feel a fresh wind, do you? Amen.